Ooh, it's getting hot. Oh, hit the deck! Metroid Prime. I'm sweating bullets. Nintendo dodged the 3D leap to the 64 for a lack of ideas? Going so far as to outsource GameCube Metroid development from the land of the rising sun to the land of burning streets, America. And they served a pretty tall order to Retro Studios who, all things considered, produced some quality stuff. I'm not a Metroid fan, but these games gave me something completely new, a challenge to the way I view games criticism. These games, and particularly the first two, undercut my expectations, forced me to see games in a way I hadn't considered. And while I think my experiences are valid, I want to say, if you're a staunch Metroid friend, this might not be for you. But I am thinking of you. Prime 1 is one of the most celebrated games of all time, and it's a shame I missed the boat. Though I have learned that not all games are made specifically for me. It's an action adventure, a first person adventure, a jumble of genre labels that exist to communicate that the game doesn't push any of its major pillars to the extreme. Except maybe the walking part, exploration is their word, and translating that fast paced space pirate blasting fun to 3D would be pretty hard. So they didn't. I mean, don't get angry, the pieces are all here. Samus, aliens, shootable doors, upgrades and secrets, objects that your abilities and upgrades interact with, but they feel nothing alike. Samus walks significantly slower, and fair enough, speed it up and you're fixing for motion sickness. Combat is slower. There's no real translation for just mashing B and watching dudes pop. And that's the price of adding a dimension, I guess. I would still call Prime an incredible imagining of Metroid in 3D. It does a lot of good. The game's beautiful, there's no denying it. This came out for the GameCube? Granted, I'm playing the Wii U trilogy, but it's a feat. It puts you directly in Samus's shoes, gun arm, reflection, death scream, everything. The game will shut the hell up and leave you alone to figure it all out yourself, if you want it to. I don't value that, but I know a lot of people who do, so respect. It's worth noting that these things are triumphs of aesthetics, immersion, and player-directed challenge. Metroid Prime has some issues, not that they're unknown, but some of them kind of get glossed sometimes. I think people will forgive loads of things if the entirety of the experience can suck them in, sell them on the world, or if the game's part of their personal life tapestry. Turns out I'm not people. Let's start with combat, the softball. Combat was, according to the developers, a secondary consideration, but it's still one of the pillars of the game. It's how you interact with enemies, it's how you deal with bosses, it's how you beat the game, right? Yes and no. You've got your default blaster and a series of beams, along with a consumable missile power supply. It's neat that you can do things like freeze an enemy and shatter him with a missile. Now I could break down every enemy type in the game, but the gist is that combat is almost devoid of challenge if you're paying attention, and hardly worth the effort. Enemies have enough health to be a roadblock if you engage, but certainly don't attack fast enough to be threatening. I had to download someone else's death scream to use earlier. That's how easy it is. A link in the description. And yeah, I know I'm an adult and difficulty is dependent on the player and it's fine if you died. And let's not forget, enemy attacks hurt less than a paintball and your health pool is wildly inflated by comparison and always growing. Enemies are probably designed how they are because shooting in 3D on the original controls is acceptable but imperfect and because you're gonna be seeing them a lot, like a lot a lot due to backtracking or just being lost, but only rarely are you forced to fight. Most times you can just slip away and you might as well because combat's slow and because you'll probably save on health and resources by walking away instead of blasting for 30 seconds and having to roll the bones for health and missile drops, then walking a couple rooms and having to do it again. Saves on repetition anyway. But the message is clear, combat doesn't matter and enemies don't matter if I don't have to fight them and the rewards are nothing. You don't get anything for killing enemies except potential refills on resources. So combat is a tool, secondary to the game. Except boss fighting is essential to completion and most boss fights are resolved with the gun. Now some of the fights are good. Flagro with its environmental interaction and multiple tool use make for a dynamic battle, but this is the exception. Some fights treat Metroid Prime combat like it should be, as combat puzzle solving because it just ain't a twitchy, dexterous FPS. Unfortunately, several fights are actually unironic 20 minute slogs with simplistic and repetitive patterns unless you know what you're doing out of the gate and man it's just not fun get the f back in the rain it's hard to remember anything but the miserable fights though and I'll attribute that to combat being a secondary consideration they're not awful they just feel like 
hardtack. Takes a while to eat, but yeah, it is calories. At the same time, combat feels somewhat appropriate for the new direction. Like a Greek hero having to win with wits over brawn or dexterity. I just wish it were more threatening, instead of bumper cars. This is anecdotal, but a friend was surprised to hear me call the wave beam overpowered, because it's almost all I used, except, you know, when you can only shoot the blue beam on the blue alien. What can I say? The charge shot homes in, and releasing then holding A again causes an insta shot while you're charging. So you charge shot, insta charge shot, charge shot, insta shot, kill almost everything in the game, all while stun locking most enemies. And the 3D space and slow moving AI makes kiting easy. Now the issues with combat are exacerbated by the exploration, the chief design pillar of Prime. By itself, exploration can be fun. I had fun for the first five hours of the first two games, because walking through everything is neat, encountering new life forms is cool. It's when these things blur because my eyelids are drooping that it's an issue. The world of Prime is a series of fairly contiguous zones divided by rooms, and all told, they're fairly linear, though I needed to open my map quite a bit because of the general verticality of the environments. There's a lot of little secrets, hidden upgrades, some of the power-ups aren't even required to beat the game. That sounds cool! The secrets mostly serve to inflate Samus's bloated health pool and missile tank. Missile upgrades are nice, I guess, but you're never gonna be able to tell me that five more shootable concussive blasts is worth the ten minutes spent finding them. I'm just mad my brain doesn't like what everyone else has fun with. But I said all I needed right from the start. Samus is slow and the levels are pretty big, and the game's asking you to travel all over it for all kinds of reasons. And the game will ask you to backtrack through older areas partway through some newer ones. This ain't Super Metroid, okay? I can't shoulder tackle my way through the sound barrier. Ten hours in, you end up looking like this. Oh no, not lava damage. And another anecdote, I often found a section of content, recorded it, then left the program open for one to two hours at a time, trying to find the next content. I took six hours of footage of my 20 hour playthrough. It really highlights how little you actually do in the game. Now hold on, I understand that people make their own fun in these games, and I get that backtracking through stuff is pretty simple and inoffensive. It's a matter of reading the map carefully and learning it. It's the kind of game that really rewards repeat playthroughs and environmental mastery, but it's unlikely that anyone turned off by what the game does is gonna stick around to give it that time. And I think that's worth exploring. Like. Why are so many rooms devoid of fights, but filled with momentum killers? The flame jets from the floor, the eyes you have to stop and shoot to pass unharmed, the monsters you have to convert into platforms with gunfire. It's fine on a first pass, but really adds up over time. Okay, so exploration isn't bad as a rule, but it tends to get to an unfun place, and certainly on a first playthrough. Crazy then to think that they capped off their game with the artifact hunt into two 20 minute boss fights. I can't think of a single reason the artifact hunt exists, except to fulfill some arbitrary lore requirement that could have been rewritten. But yeah, I really wish I did not have to scour the entire world map again for a plethora of cryptically hidden Chozo artifacts, like finding needles in haystacks. I like the one that requires equipping a specific and niche visor in a place that isn't picked up by the scan visor, personally. That one's so sick, dude. Speaking of the visor, I really like how the game uses scanning to teach the player what they need. It's the best part of exploration, being curious about something, throwing up that visor and getting info. The game even teaches you to pull it up when you're confused by having it activate switches and elevators, revealing boss weak points, etc. Not a huge fan of the additional visors for their mostly niche applications, especially with the artifact example, but they're mostly harmless. What I'm baffled by is the lore. Storytelling, lore, immersion, these words come up frequently in the discourse of Metroid Prime. The story Prime tells is largely passive, found in text-based lore dumps on scannable objects, and up to the player to scan as much as they please to form a coherent narrative with. There's no mechanical benefit to doing so, the story isn't incredibly deep or riveting, it's a lot of sci-fi tech jargon, and I'm left wondering why so many people put so much stock into it. And if that's your thing, using text in your own adventures to form a lively history of a fictional place, more power to you. But to be absolutely clear, Metroid Prime is Metroid's gameplay with a very thin coat of alien world building painted on top. Everything exists for Samus from the switches you aim to shoot at, to the doors you shoot open, to the bomb slots and spinner puzzles, to the morph ball tracks. The game gets spoken of like an immersive sim, and fair enough, it might be the closest thing on the GameCube, but the world is so transparently created for Samus, and it's the opposite of believable world building. Not to mention, 
change in the miraculously diverse biomes coexisting between walls and doors. I bring this issue up now, though it gets much worse later on, because I feel a need to justify my inability to be moved or enraptured by the setting. It's fine for a first pass, by the way. Bringing Metroid into 3D means carrying certain familiar elements over, and I wouldn't knock it for that. And it kind of works on Talon 4 if we accept that the Chozo, who inhabited the planet and whose technology Samus uses, used Morph Ball tracks, bomb slots, whatever to traverse their planet. The Chozo will be used for maximum world-building convenience going forward, having apparently visited everybody and shared everything. But we'll talk about it when it comes up in Echoes. In the end, I think Metroid Prime's the kind of game you have to drown yourself in, and real life's doing a good enough job of that already. It even got a free time. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. Whew, this game must feel good to be good at, huh? Echoes is the dark and brooding sequel, and it's where most of my issues kind of come to a head. I don't think it's a bad game, not even close, but it's the entry that pulls me in and pushes me out with equal ferocity. Starting with the great, the game is scarier by far, forlorn and foreboding, corpses in almost every zone, the intro with zombie-like enemies, the dark world and everything you fight therein, the truly alien Ing species, it's a really neat flavor of Metroid, like this Patrick Bateman ice cream. I really I really like the stronger visual cohesion overall. From the Aegon Wastes to the Torvis Bog, the world is painted with a consistent palette in a way that Prime 1 wasn't. It does a lot of work making the planet actually feel like one, though I will say the last major area, Sanctuary, though cool, feels a little out of place. You what? There weren't any buildings? The map design is more clustered than it was before, making the world feel more connected overall, more organic, and for the savvy player, easier to navigate, perhaps. Unfortunately, my IQ is about 5, making me profoundly ridiculous and I struggled to memorize anything about it, opening my map constantly. I like the dark world conceptually. The player's forced to pay attention and sometimes gauge risk and reward for moving and fighting in and out of safety bubbles that actually heal you slowly. It's great for making a player like me stay focused when I was so used to glazing over in the first game. My first recorded death happened because I disrespected the toxic air. It's a good way to communicate that the game has stakes, should be taken somewhat seriously. It's also a great way to reuse a lot of assets while producing meaningful content. Content. Lastly, I think a lot of the bosses are better overall, though the scale's tipping neutral here. They're more dangerous by far, mostly because of the dark world and having to really consider your positioning on top of everything else you'd expect, like with the worm here. They still take forever, really not a fan of the moth. Quadraxis is one of those fights that every boss should probably be. A ton of phase variation and combat puzzle solving, utilizing many tools to win. Unfortunately, boss difficulty fluctuates between total pushover to slightly unfair. This isn't new, but the fish's arena and we point are both too small to make for a clean fight. Sometimes you're fighting the AI to allow the fight to progress at all. Sometimes the boss's moves, boost guardian, are faster than a human can reasonably react to, and there's no safe spot on top of it, thanks to the air. I like unique challenges like the spider guardian fight for being restricted to the morph ball. Those fights are cool in general. It kind of implied that the ball isn't just a gimmick. It's a shame fights like Dark Samus exist where I'm in this epic clash with my evil half, but it barely does damage and it's constantly blowing up pillars that drop tons of health. Overall, the game has strong bosses that avoid feeling samey, and the ending fights in particular really cap the game off well. Echoes does a lot of stuff I'll never understand, and I find it especially annoying because it's a sequel. For the most part, these are issues that I had with the first game that never got fixed on round two. And they're not a set of fatal flaws with the design, but they really impacted the experience. The dark world is cool and good and all that, but where's the interworld puzzle solving? They do it a couple of times, but it seems like it should be in every zone multiple times. Oracle of Ages was cool, you know, you can steal good stuff. One of the things Prime did was tack on environmental damage, which makes sense. It's an alien planet, but it was one of the only ways the game could consistently threaten you. The dark world obviously doubles up on this, turning the air itself into a threat, but it often means I'll just run from a fight, and while I did that before, I'm now running from 95% of fights instead of 80. That's because this game's death by a thousand cuts, and while you may win in 10, your health is always being whittled away, and health isn't guaranteed to drop from enemies or destructible objects. But you can wait in the healing light if you're away from a save point, for like, five real life minutes. What I'm getting at is the means by which the game commands my attention, the Dark World, very frequently demands that I stop to wait, or not bother fighting. It's that, or progress at a snail's pace. It's sunken time, unless you run. And I wouldn't mind sinking time into combat if they had a reward. Many of the enemies are slightly more threatening and interesting, but instead of having three unique beams to play with, you get the default one, and two ammo-based beams whose ammo is fairly scarce. You know how this goes, I didn't use the beams regularly until my ammo pool and health were sufficiently inflated by the 
the end game, but by then I was ready to check out. I really dislike leaving the cool annihilator beam to the very end as well. It was really disappointing hardly being able to play around with the few combat tools the game gives. The game is longer now, and man, between the dark world thing, constant battles, I'm constantly running from, always recharging at save and ammo stations, being lost in the maze-like design of the levels, I feel like I'm going to and doing even less content than before, all without a reason to engage in combat. I don't really understand that. It feels like such an opportunity, with the poison arrow and all, to make these tightly designed chunks of content that really challenge the player. But things are stretched out. You're still made to backtrack a couple of times to completely silly places. That's not a new complaint, but the justification is the main line of progression suddenly diverges and gives the player a chance to take a break, collect some power-ups, maybe find some secret upgrades along the way, revisit old areas with new eyes. But in the break during Sanctuary that requires a trip to the bog, it's a minimum 30 minute walk without fighting. And in a much more linear game, a much more tightly designed experience, the goal wouldn't be to maybe stockpile as much power as possible while grabbing an essential upgrade from an old zone's content pool, because combat and progression would be fun, meaningful, and devoid of detour. But the game isn't concerned with combat as a meaningful pillar of gameplay, and assumes that debatably aimless wandering is engaging for the player. So it languishes and props up an experience that some players will find unforgettable, and others will put down in hours. And fair enough, I've heard the people who love that isolationist character building and wit testing gameplay talk, and it's convincing. Only it evaporates when I'm playing. The game's difficulty crumbles to time and knowledge instead of any kind of mechanical mastery, and I hate that. And for all those problems that most people don't consider problems, blessed souls that you are, they included the artifact hunt again, but this time you can't collect most until the end of the game. And they put in fast travel, but only at the end of the game. This game would be 100 times more playable with fast travel. I know that's a Metroid sin, but for my sake. To end with a bang, world building bad? Okay. Hear me out. The first game was fine. It was Metroid's first leap to 3D. It uh, had to feel familiar. Echoes takes place on a different planet with a different inhabiting race and therefore different cultural norms and expectations. I just think it's weird how these Luminoth, these moth people, carry around giant balls to do spinner puzzles for tech maintenance, how they built morph ball tracks, how some of their consoles are designed to take a morph ball bomb as power, why spider tracks exist at all, why you need to shoot their doors to walk through, they don't have guns, how the doors are six feet tall, but Luminoth are 12 feet tall? All that work to write out all those text blurbs, all that visually cohesive world design, all that interconnectedness, and it's not even trying to play at world building, at proper immersion. I just don't get it. I wouldn't even care if I didn't keep hearing how immersive this experience is, but it stretches the suspension of disbelief to the breaking point more than Prime ever did, just by virtue of the Chozos not being the inhabiting species. So of course, the excuse is that the Chozos visited the Luminoth and taught them all kinds of stuff. Like how to turn into a ball and power a bomb slot. I'm sorry, I'm whining, I just... This game is quite literally about a world having its dark and light half split apart in different dimensions and fighting your dark half. This isn't some feat of believability or world building. It's gamified pulp sci-fi schlock. And that's important considering the reception to part three. I'm just disappointed because it was such a clear opportunity to take the game to the place people imagine it is. And to be fair to them, they included natural insect burrows and stuff instead of traditional morph ball tunnels, so they were going in the right direction. It's just the world falls apart a few hours in. I'm left with the conclusion that people value building up an avatar and walking around a mostly non-committal world. And that's fine and partially explains what happened with the next game. Man, corruption's so fun. It's such a cozy experience. Here's a list of words associated with the discourse of Metroid Prime 3 corruption. Streamlined. Halo. F***ing. Aurora Unit. Dialogue. Gimmicky. Aw oh man, I had fun wrong. Darn. Corruption gets the most critical flack from YouTubers and for a lot of what I want to call ephemeral reasons, because the gist is the game handles the series in a way a lot of people find objectionable, though I think the game puts the focus on different things and often to great benefit. Streamlined gimmicky, those words come up fairly often because the game moved to the Wii, committed to motion controls, and simplified the experience. For this particular series, I refuse to call that anything but good because it's fun and playable, easily more so than the other games. It attempts to solve a lot of issues the series had too, though it does move away from the previous two in ways that understandably created animosity, so let's sort it out. Samus can reach out and touch the environment in some contexts, and I find that infinitely more immersive than bomb slots and spinner puzzles. Engaging with the environment in somewhat believable ways is good, even if it gets a little silly sometimes. 
Yes, let me activate the alien tech with this mini game for five-year-olds. I don't know why the word used is gimmicky. Motion controls are just as mechanically substantive as hitting A to drop a bomb in a hole, only it makes way more sense. You're asked to grapple stuff and yank it away with a nunchuck pull, and yeah, it's a little slow, but it's infrequent, and unlike most progression gates, is firmly grounded in believability. Even though they kept the door shooting and other stuff, they've made an attempt to ground the world, and you get quality aiming controls too. I don't think that's gimmicky at all, just more immersive. Combat's slightly better for a few reasons, even though the game still allows you to run for most fights and there are no significant rewards for finishing combat, shame on you, they've attempted to give your inflated health pool purpose. You can sacrifice a full health tank to enter hyper mode thanks to the harness corrupting power of Phazon and melt your enemies while being invincible. It's sacrifice for power, a common and enjoyable design technique found in games like Magic the Gathering. Sacrificing life to draw cards, giving blood to get juice. You get this bar at the top too that will kill you if you let it fill up, but you'll easily burn through it by rapidly shooting. The trick is, you can extend how much mileage you get from hyper mode by not blasting it all out at once, and actually flirt with death, which I find immensely fun, though it'll end no matter what after 25 seconds. On top of that, the game can kill you regardless of your health now, though it's rare. If an enemy hits you with a phase on grenade, you'll involuntarily enter hyper mode and have to vent that rapidly filling bar or just die. So it's basically punishing the player with a status ailment for a poor positioning that, once understood, allows you even more fun firepower and doesn't steal control from the player, like entering a berserk state and being forced to swing or die, but being able to aim it. I really like that. Hyper mode's unfortunate downfall is its power. Losing one health bar isn't a downside, and it should be, because invincibility is ridiculous, and your power basically doubles. Early game it's not a problem, because your health tanks are few, but in true Metroid fashion you'll end up with an enormous health bar and every fight turns into activate hyper mode and blast them. It sucks, because limiting your total health or tuning the damage might have solved it. At least it's more fun than slowly chunking every enemy to death with charge shots. And they usually throw enough enemies at the player to justify entering fun mode. There's a greater focus on regular combat puzzle solving and tool application. Encounters like the floating circles, which are just Wiimote aim tests, get lit up for being unrealistic and gimmicky, but at least they test you in a more meaningful way than stunlocking space pirates to death every time. Using red beam on red guy, and it's not like Metroid cares that much about verisimilitude. Some enemies have you rip off their armor mid combat, and I really like that too, you know, having to do things in fights. It's a more action-y, hands-on approach to battle that just wasn't present in previous games. I wish they went with Prime 1's approach to beams. The current system has your default beam powering up twice, but retaining the abilities of previous ones. It's fine, I guess, but if combat's gonna have more enemies and a resource dump system that some players will be afraid to engage with, I think there should be even more ways to engage with combat to make it fun and interesting. A beam that ricochets off walls, for example, because many fights are in cramped quarters. A phase on blade arm with a chargeable projectile. A charged missile that could corrupt an enemy AI and make it yours for a bit. You could even use the blade for cutting overgrowth and exploration, and have the ricochet beam activate switches that require multiple rapid hits. The attempts made by the game to spice up combat are incredibly safe, all things considered, and there's tons of room to experiment with Samus. The bosses are fascinating because you have to kill them with hyper mode, at least the major ones. I've heard that it's embarrassingly easy to melt them like this, but in my experience, the actual time a phase takes to open the possibility of using hyper mode is sensible. Basically, fights take 5 to 10 sensible minutes instead of 20. There's enough phase variation in diverse tool application that fights feel no different than before, only with that visceral whip factor. For the first time in any of these games, they let the player directly interact with an enemy. For the first time, I was actually having fun. Ooh, get him! Yeah, boy! Shit! So this is where differing player values enter the discourse. Combat is a challenge thrown at the player, one of the pillars of Prime's design, and the game throws more than boss combat at the player. There's one fight that requires equal blasting and object interaction. There's one fight that requires blowing up ships and minions before you explode. There's a series of fights where the doors lock and you need to shoot it out, and this can only be a good thing. Treating combat as valuable is important when you're a bounty hunter, and your hand's a f***ing gun, when combat's hardly been pushed in other games. There's one where you need to protect a bunch of weak bomb squad guys, and the only realistic way to do that is entering hyper mode and going full aggro. It's tense and fun, because you're wondering if you'll run out of health or not go hard enough and let your soldiers die. But combat as a challenge is pretty transparently not valued by the loudest critics of the game. With full respect, these two videos both use Halo as a negative comparison to demonstrate that corruption is playing at being something it's not. The argument is that Metroid was never really good at combat or why the games were celebrated, and yeah, those GameCube controls weren't that great, you know? So doing all these combat segments, all these scripted events, even the drawn-out cinematic intro, does a disservice to the series. That and the more, uh, 
obvious pulp sci-fi direction is an unwelcome shift in tone. And if that's not 100% accurate to what they're getting at, it's certainly an undercurrent that informs their analysis. I think it emerged because the game pumps up its combat segments and detracts from the isolationist exploration in a contiguous world thing. But I'm left with the impression that if they had one limp arm, they'd be happy as long as their other arm threw a killer fastball. Yeah, the game's pumping one pillar at mild cost to the other. It does streamline in places, like how the levels are subdivided into zones that are easily traversed. I personally found them digestible for once. I actually knew where I was going frequently. And it's not like there's nothing to explore. Realistically, it only means that there's a save point and a short cutscene dividing any zone, which is welcome in a franchise where I've been aimlessly wandering through my initial playthroughs. And yeah, the Aurora unit will contact you and direct you to objectives, even if the player turns off the hint system. And that's obviously going to be annoying to players who look at Metroid as a game to truly delve into. But I don't look at Metroid as some big brain boy paradise. It's a fairly easy Nintendo game that would drop hints anyway. I just like knowing I'm doing things. Different strokes. Seriously, I would have killed for proper fast travel in the first two, and they went ahead and fixed the artifact hunt. You only need five, and most are easily accessible on the main path the game takes you on. But I'm getting off topic. GMT says in his Prime 1 video that Metroid Prime was never some brain dead shooter, but uses Halo as an example in a later video, which kind of baffles me. On heroic difficulty anyway, Halo is anything but brainless. It's a lot of quick prioritizing, decision making, and executing. Guerrilla combat that's engaging. Presumably it's brainless because you don't do bomb slot puzzle or scan floor so you can drop bomb. Hmm. Okay, enough ribbing. I understand the basic idea that Prime 1 and 2 both did better at being unique than playing its sci-fi shooter. At least they tried to design it better, give it more attention. Like, I would never have liked this game if it was just one or two again. Probably should have made it genuinely challenging, but that might have required a cap to Metroid's ludicrous health pool, a compromise on tradition, among other things. Both videos don't want Metroid to be Halo. It's Halo because there's cutscenes, characters are talking, Samus isn't all alone for once, and there's AAA action sections. But it's weird to me because these elements flesh out the universe, make for proper world building, diversify the experience, and those elements aren't inherently Halo, which manages to give the player control during several action scenes instead of inserting cutscenes and static shooting segments. I think what they're communicating is that Metroid shouldn't play at pulp sci-fi action, should be quiet and reserved, and maybe. But my takeaway is that Metroid actually really blows at having a believable world, constantly flirts with being pulp sci-fi, which I already talked about. I mean, she's got a gun arm, dude, doesn't really demand being taken seriously except by virtue of the scenario. Like, yes, the scenarios presented in Metroid are serious, but the world building bits jar the mood so hard I can't look at it that way. Compared to Halo, which, while being a pretty humble sci-fi FPS with a similarly plank-like protagonist, manages to weave in strong themes of carrying the weight of the world, spirituality, loss of faith, and yes, isolation, all while being comedic and alive, human in a way that Metroid never really is but it's pulp too. I think the Prime series could learn quite a lot from Halo. I won't debate that the tone has shifted. It's easily more epic than it was lonely, but the gameplay is more action-y, more fun. I don't see it as a problem, and it's probably the best way to conclude the trilogy. So I think that's what I see in Prime 3, an attempt to make combat engaging, a simplification of the elements that before had me staring at Twitter and taking extended breaks, an attempt to add life to this humorless expanse. Unless, you know, that TV Tropes Metroid Prime funny page does it for you. If I've learned anything from talking to close friends, it's that, yeah, this wasn't made for me, and that's why I've tried to be polite about it, because what Metroid Prime offers, and considering when and where it was being offered, is awesome. A rarity in gaming. Play Prime 1 and 2 if you're fixing to get lost in a world completely alone. Play Prime 3 if you want a quicker romp through a more action-packed game that retains some of the strongest elements of the original games and sharpens their weaker points. And pick up an immersive sim if you're looking for immersion. You know, don't let Nintendo own you. Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... Errol. Azero. Bazcart. Beverage Crisp. Boha. Brandon. Caesar T. Chief. Corgi the Lad. Crack Stuntman, Kyle Lapreed, David Castillo, Don't Worry About It, Dylan Coffey, Exa, Frankenstitch, Harkaj, Huey, Jason Lasky, Jaden, J. Deus, John Weber, Joke Frog, Justin Sherry, Kelvin, Latrix, Laundry Mom, 
Lego Sid, Markules, Marmato, Max Gomez, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Milky Moo Official, Miles Burris, Neatsy, Old Burgle, Horn Magnus Palson, Quillworth, Reggie Rodriguez, Salty Smasher, Sam Anga, Sekai Noah Warida, Seamus Nerd, Shod, Simp God, Special Children, Super Sandwich Guy, Thrips Heartrop, Venom, Vic, Walter Taggart, Well Shit, Zachary V, Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.